Yes, sir. Um, you spoke of the erosion of uh, relations between the Affection, mother country yeah. and, and uh, the colonies over a long period of time. And two contributing factors occur to me. One is geographical and the other is sociological. In other words, first of all, it took months to get news across the ocean and back again. Uh, so that the process of government was unwieldy at best. And secondly, uh, we had had since the 1500s easily 200 years of um, opportunity to build a culture, if you will, of our own, uh, which I believe had been diverging o over that time. So could you discuss uh, either of those factors. Well, it's interesting what you say about the communication. Uh, actually, in the 1970s, there was a history book on the period that we're discussing between Dan, Dan, uh, Ben Labrie and Ian Christie. Yeah. They wrote a book, separate chapters. And you can, uh, it's not in print any longer, but uh, Christie and Labrie, one Labrie the American, Christie the British historian, both of them distinguished historians, and they alternated chapters, and they both concluded that if there'd been the instant communications that we have today, that there might not have been uh, a revolution. And people would have been able to communicate. You're quite right. It would take six weeks to go back and forth. Uh, I'm not so convinced yeah. of that. Uh, but it, it is an interesting uh, suggestion. Uh, now, uh, your other issue was? Uh, culture. Uh, the, divergent culture. Oh, the different. Of course, beneath the surface, uh, the Americans were a very different place, although they didn't think so at the outset. They thought, and maybe they just, in other words, they were farther away from London than Cornwall, but they're not all that different from Cornwall, and they didn't see themselves as being different. Uh, it's the debate with Great Britain that takes place between 1765 and 1775 that I think exposes what had been this growing difference. They didn't think of themselves as different. They, uh, they think of themselves almost uniformly as good Englishmen. Uh, and there's no sense of being of, of rebellion that I get earlier than, than the, the period that we're talking about. You don't have any sense that they're, they're not good, they're good, that they're a different people and they're going to separate. The English government worries about that from the very beginning of the 18th century. They're the ones that use the term the Americans. The Americans over there. Uh, and you find the, it's the English government that's fearful of independence. And you don't get a much uh, in the way. I think it, what happens is, is the debate uncovers this different, these different cultures. They're not that different. I mean, it's still common law. And this is the real advantage of the American Revolution over, say, the French Revolution. They were Englishmen who had had self-government for a century or more. They had a habeas corpus. They had trial by jury. They had all the things that enabled them to, um, to, to become self-governing. We see the problems today in the Arab Spring. These people have no experience. And that was true even of the French Revolution. They hadn't been in the States General since the 1614 or 1617. So the French had no experience with self-government. But these rebels, these American rebels did. And I think that made all the difference. Can, can I just, I mean, I, I, mean I, I think it's really important to think about that particular question in a comparative context. So um, the issue about news, I mean, absolutely it takes time, and this might make a big difference, but the Spanish Empire had exactly the same trouble, right? Um, they had the same problem about getting news, and the Spanish Empire, they, the Spanish were, after the, the, uh, the Seven Years' War, or maybe we should call it the Nine Years' War, I'm perfectly happy to call it that, uh, uh, were also beset by debt, right? Um, but the, Sp the Spanish Empire falls apart not because of any revolution. It falls apart because Napoleon successfully invades Spain and it breaks apart unwillingly. They want it to, rem to remain loyal. So I don't think you can say just sort of news. I mean, right, I mean, they had the same, take longer to get, took longer to get news and information to Lima than it did to get to Boston, 
by a long shot. Um, so I don't think that really can play such a big factor. Uh, uh, the sociological issue, I also think one needs to be careful about that. I, I sort of, I'm very much sort of in, in, uh, in, uh, 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 in Gordon's, uh, along with Gordon, I don't think it's the sociological differences because the sociological differences uh, between, again, various of the Spanish, uh, of the Spanish colonies and Spain were extremely dramatic. But there was not the tradition, and the Spanish government was governed by a uh, the Spanish Empire was governed by audien uh, audiencias, right, a series of courts. There was no tradition of represent Sorry. representation, which explains some of the mess that happens in Argentina uh, in the in the early 19th century. Um, so there was this this alternative tradition, this tradition of representation, and the problem I think, and it's a problem which is which is articulated among the British from the beginning of the 18th century is how do we actually coordinate to give, how do we actually give the colonists in Jamaica, in Massachusetts, uh, in South Carolina, some form of real representation in this government. And it's precisely, I mean, I think Gordon's absolutely right. The word independency is on the mind of Tory, uh, is on the mouths of Tory politicians from 1701. Um, uh, the concern about independency is a, is a real concern. And there's this huge debate, and, and the difference of the kind of outcome that you get has to do, I think, in part with this kind of political tradition. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to add something to the sociological difference, there is a difference well, uh, in yeah. the sense that there are no real aristocrats yeah, sure. in, in, in the colonies. I mean, when, when people come from England and see George Washington's Mount Vernon, he's minor gentry. And yet, in Virginia, he's a pretty big shot. I mean, you, there's nothing on the scale. If you've been to England and seen these country houses, yeah, yeah. I mean, the Duke of Rockingham's house was 650 feet long. I mean, that's longer than two football fields. And there's just nothing, you know, there's nothing like that in the colonies. The, uh, I mean, uh, Mount Vernon's a very impressive plantation, but it's, it's miniature compared to the scale of these English aristocratic homes. So you don't have those aristocrats. It's minor gentry. They're not middle class, that would be the wrong yeah. term to apply to them, but they're, they're not the kind of, there's not the kind of aristocracy, and they become, that, that exist in England, they be, Americans become very aware of that and see themselves as a much more egalitarian society. Of course, looking back from Today's vantage point, they don't seem egalitarian at all, distinctions between aristocratic southern planters and their slaveholding planters and, and, and ordinary farmers seems very great. But in their minds, they see themselves as being much more egalitarian, and that is exposed as well, I think, uh, in the revolutionary uh, rhetoric. Uh, there must be other questions. I'm sure that we're over here. Oh, okay, here. Uh, could, you, uh, could you comment uh, on the apparent, the genesis of the apparent conversion of uh, Benjamin Franklin's thought during this period of time? On a more personal note, particularly with reference to uh, the tr his treatment by Parliament. Well, actually, his treatment was by one of these characters, Wedderburn, the Solicitor General. But uh, Franklin, I've written a book on this, it, the Americanization of Franklin. He is really quite loyal. He goes over to the London as an agent for the uh, Pennsylvania Assembly in 1757, comes back for about uh, 18 months to look after his post office in 1760s, mid-1764, and then goes back to England and stays there until March of 1775. So he has been, for the whole period from essentially 1757 to 1775, he has been a resident of London, leaving poor Deborah back uh, home in, uh, in Philadelphia. He comes to the, uh, to the revolution hesitantly. He's trying to hold the empire together. He's a really, I think, a loyal Brit. He believes in the empire, but he's also an American, and he resents, and this is an aspect that we haven't touched on, there's a kind of English arrogance that emerges, I think. Uh, South, and, and Steve can correct me on this, because he's a, an English historian, but. Uh, there's an English arrogance that emerges in the middle of the 18th century to, uh, against those peripheral parts of the Scots, the Welsh, the Irish. They're not really English. And they, these peripheral parts of the empire, and the North Americans, they feel this. Washington certainly felt it. He, he, could, he tries for a, a royal commission, 
and he's turned down, and he's being ordered around. He, although he's a colonel in the Virginia militia, he's being ordered around by these captains who have a commission in the royal, a royal commission. So I think that arrogance plays a part. Franklin feels some of this, and uh, he keeps trying to, to hold things together. He, he actually has a naive view. He, right at one point he says, look, a couple of savvy people like myself and, and, and maybe uh, Lord Dartmouth could sit down and we could settle these issues in a half an hour. I mean, that kind of view, the kind of the George Cannon view of diplomacy. You know, if you just get a couple of bright guys and they'll settle, settle major problems. Franklin realizes uh, very late with, uh, he, he gets caught uh, passing papers to the Hutchinson letters. It's a kind of a mini scandal. And this is what leads to the uh, accusations in the cockpit. It's by the administration. It's not parliament. It's, uh, uh, and the whole court turns out to witness uh, this uh, attack, which goes on for an hour by Wedderburn, uh, a vicious attack, uh, more or less saying Franklin is not a gentleman because Franklin had opened some mail. And he says, gentlemen, do not open other people's mail, that kind of attack. And from that moment on, Franklin is, is is, I think, Americanized. But he still hangs around because Lord Chatham, William Pitt, with a title, comes to visit him. And that, at his house, in, apartment in Craven Street, which, by the way, is open to the public now. There's a tourist site uh, in, in London. And he's so taken with the idea that Chatham would actually come to him uh, for advice. Uh, he, uh, he, he stays around thinking that there's one da des desperate hope. And Chatham makes a, a statesmanlike proposal, I think, in February of 1775 to hold the empire together. But it, it's defeated two to one, I think, in Parliament. It, it wasn't a ghost of a chance. And at that moment, uh, Franklin realizes all is lost. And he, but he's about to be arrested, he thinks. And he gets on a boat in March of 1775 and comes back. To, be, to accusations that he's a mole, that he's a spy. And so he has to act as a super patriot to offset those uh, rumors uh, that, um, that someone like James Madison actually believes. He, he's getting, he's getting uh, information from his former college roommate at Bradford that, that Franklin is, is suspected of being a spy. So Franklin's journey to independence, uh, to, to uh, Americanization, if, if you will, is, is I think, a, uh, a slow one and, and kind of awkward one. A long-winded answer to your, to your question, but 